that you're with us today. Um, for those who uh, are aware, we are live tweeting today's event using Kennedy Live. Uh, you can also, um, if you're not following us on Facebook, we have a number of events, especially from this time of the semester on, that seem to pop into the schedule. We are starting a little bit late, unfortunately, because we had a visit from Undersecretary Rose Gutmiller, the Undersecretary of State for Disarmament and Nuclear Policy. These things happen, so uh, another reason to follow us online and be up to date on everything that's happening. If you'll indulge me for just a moment, um, we are at that time of the semester where there's lots of things going on. I just want to kind of make you aware of at least the next uh, round of events. Um, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in this room, we'll be hosting the Ambassador of Mongolia, His Excellency Bulga Alga Tangarel, on Mongolian foreign policy priorities. Again, tomorrow the 23rd at 11 a.m. Uh, next week, uh, on Tuesday, in a new date change at 2 p.m. in this room, we'll be hosting His Excellency Jalal Abbas Jalani, the Pakistan Ambassador to the United States. He'll be talking about regional security perspectives from the Pakistan perspective. On the 30th of October, we are very pleased to welcome, in partnership with the New York Times, Somini Sengupta, who is a New York Times reporter. She is the UN Bureau Chief currently. She has a very provocative title, ISIS, Ebola, and the Bodies That Fell from the Sky, A View of Global Crises from the UN. So pretty much everything that scares you at night, um, that will be the day before Halloween. Um, but if you follow her writing in the New York Times, she does a great job of covering what's going on with the UN. I think one of the most um, lucid uh, UN correspondents the New York Times has had for a long time. So that's in partnership with our New York Times program. We hope you'll pick up your free copy as you, as you leave today. Uh, and then finally, on, on Wednesday, November 12th, as our series continues, we'll be welcoming Laurie Blank, who's a professor of law at Emory University School of Law. She'll be speaking on the end of war um, that's neither all of the events that are coming up, nor just the highlights, but just some that you may be interested in. We hope um, for those of you who are uh, also interested in careers in the Foreign Service, you'll come back at 3 o'clock today. Our Foreign Service student organization will be holding their once annual career workshop on careers in the Foreign Service, both on the exams and the process uh, to become a Foreign Service officer. Thanks for indulging all of that. Um, we'd like to begin with an opening prayer, as is our custom, and we've asked Ale uh, Ailia Stevens, who's a European Studies major from Orem, Utah, to offer our opening prayer. After that, I'll turn the time over to Professor Eric Dursteller, Professor of History at BYU, who will introduce uh, Professor Scholl. Ailia? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to attend this lecture. We're grateful for the opportunity to study at this university and to be able to broaden our minds and be able to use that knowledge to serve those around us. Please help us to be able to remember what we learn and be able to have the spirit to be with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Kent Schull, uh, who is our speaker today. Uh, he is an associate professor of history at uh, Binghamton University in New York. Uh, he received his PhD in 2007 from uh, University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA. Uh, he has lived and worked extensively throughout the Middle East, including two years on a Fulbright uh, fellowship uh, in Turkey with his family, um, and his work uh, focuses on a wide range of topics, uh, including crime and punishment in the Ottoman Empire, uh, the modern Middle East, and Muslims in, in North America and Europe. Uh, this year, his uh, first book, Prisons in the Late Ottoman Empire, Microcosms of Modernity, uh, came out with uh, Edinburgh uh, University Press. A uh, second book, Living in the Ottoman Realm, Sultans, Subjects, and Elites, which he's co-editing uh, with another scholar, will be published um, by Indiana University Press in uh, 2015. And he's also the editor of the Journal of Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Uh, it's a personally a pleasure for me to introduce him because he's a wonderful friend uh, and a good friend of BYU as well. Um, he is a Renaissance man. You may not uh, note now from his uh, very slim build, but he used to play B football for BYU. Uh, he earned a uh, bachelor's uh, in, uh, of arts in history in 1999 from, uh, from BYU, and he taught in the history department uh, as a visiting lecturer in 2006 and 2007. So he has a long history uh, with BYU, and it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to the university. Please join me in welcoming Kent Scholl.
Thank you very much for having me back. Um, obviously, you can tell that I have a little scruff on my face, so I hope it doesn't uh, offend too many people this way. But um, uh, the, this is a great pleasure for me to be here with you, to be able to talk with you today. I want to thank Jeff and, and Corey, uh, Kelly, very much for making arrangements, and for Eric especially, for reaching out to me and giving me this opportunity to talk to you about something that's very important to me personally. I'm, right now, I'm teaching a course at SUNY Binghamton on World War I in the Middle East. It's a full semester long course and it's something that's always been integral to my courses that I teach on the modern Middle East or the Ottoman Empire or any of those because it's such a pivotal, it's such a pivotal event. The, the argument can be made and I think very forcefully and convincingly that the, most, the single most important event in the creation of the contemporary Middle East as we know it now is World War I. It had a complete comprehensive changing an effect on the Middle East from not only uh, the, the the borders the creating new states where they did not exist before, the ending of old empires that had been in long existence, but also in terms of the demographic makeup of the Middle East, particularly Anatolia or Asia, Asia Minor, what is contemporary Turkey today. So um, I do have a slideshow. I have much more information than I could possibly get through today. So I will skip around and I hope the question and answer period will give you an opportunity to, to ask what's on your mind. This does, what we're talking about today does have impact on what's the contemporary settings in the Middle East. Uh, what we have in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict. In that regard, its beginnings and origins can come, can come right out of World War I. Uh, what's going on in terms of ISIS and others, the borders, the, the battles, the ethnic divides, the ethno-religious divides that we see in the Middle East today. I'll, yes, they have deep roots, but they really catalyze and take on a new dynamic thanks to World War I. So we'll get started there. Uh, I don't know how much you know about World War I in the Middle East. It's usually not what comes up most of the time. It's one of these, um, it's one of these things where it's the forgotten front, so to speak. We think about the Western Front. We do talk about the Russian Revolution, 1917, Russia dropping out of the war. We talk about the powers, but one of the great, uh, one of the, the big six allies in World War I was the Ottoman Empire with the Central Powers uh, versus the Entente Powers. And I don't want to go into too much detail and belabor that. I'll let you, there's plenty of good histories on the beginnings of the war and take a look at it. The, the Wikipedia file isn't that bad actually either. So you didn't hear me say, actually I, I'm being recorded. So you did hear me see that and everybody else will see it now too. So what you have um, regarding the, the, different, the different groups, the Ottoman Empire very quickly joined the, um, Top one, thank you. Very quickly joined the Central Powers with Germany and Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And while we talk about the, the fronts generally, uh, always looking at the Western Front, the trench warfare, the Eastern Front, the battles between the Austro-Hungarian and Germany and Russia, these types of things, an enormous amount of, of warfare also occurred in the Middle East, particularly in the Ottoman Empire. And that's one of the forgotten fronts that we talk about. So, uh, you know, except for Gallipoli or T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, those are the only things we usually hear about with, uh, with the Middle East. And that's thanks primarily to the British and their domination of the narrative concerning World War I. But uh, w I, the argument can be made, though, like I said, that it's the single most important event to shape the contemporary Middle East for a number of reasons, which I'll get into here today. Uh, my argument is that World War I lasts in the Middle East from 1912 until 1924. Uh, there is, or 25, you can say 25 as well. But this is the loss of life that precipitates or precedes the, the, the start of World War I, the official start, occurs, it begins in the Middle East with the Balkan Wars, 1912 to 1913. This is where, you know, the Serbian nationalist comes out of and kills the Archduke of Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire. That's the spark in the tinderbox that is known as the Balkans, okay? But that, the Balkan Wars has a huge impact on the Ottoman Empire and drives them to actually join the Central Powers in many ways and gets them into the war. The loss of life from the Balkan Wars, the loss of territory from the Ottomans, and also the enormous refugee crisis that, that occurs because of the Balkan Wars for the Ottoman Empire 
carries through and has an enormous impact on World War I itself going, going throughout and some of the dynamics that go on within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the, we say it goes right up to the Treaty of Lausanne when you finally have the end of the Turkish War of Independence, which is a direct, a direct result of World War I, the, the loss of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the carving up of the empire by the Entente powers and also different, different powers trying to, uh, different entities and groups trying to assert themselves and create their own states out of, out of, the, out of the ashes of the, of the Ottoman Empire and to the Greek-Turkish population exchanges of the early 1920s as a result of the Treaty of Lausanne. So you have, you have World War I, I can't overstress this to you, why it's so important to understand the contemporary Middle East. The Qajar Empire, or Iran, they stayed neutral in the war. They did not join the war, mainly because they were trapped between Russian and British imperialism, and because they did not have they were unable to field a sizable enough force to prevent European encroachment. They were a battlefront, though, even though they were neutral. The Ottomans, the Russians, and the British all fought each other in Iran during the war itself. And you had an enormous loss of life in Iran, not because they engaged in the combat themselves, but for residual reasons. So you have um, the Ottomans eventually entered the side of the Central Powers uh, about six months into the war but very soon afterwards. And they, that some people say, well, if they hadn't entered the war, maybe they'd still be around. We, you know, counterfactual history is problematic, but they entered the war not necessarily out of desperation, but out of a calculated judgment on their part. And it's important to understand this, why the Ottomans actually entered the war in the first place, okay? They, they did it to reverse the effects of European imperialism that had been chiseling away at the empire since the late 18th century, uh, but intensified as the 19th century went on. Uh, they were suffering from in, um, predations by the territorial predations by the, by the European forces, by Europeans, uh, European powers. Uh, they were also, which, which were also stirring up nationalist revolts within the Ottoman Empire, particularly in the Balkans in these areas. And so they also had very detrimental economic and industrialization effects on the Middle East, stymieing their industrial production and their ability to engage in the Industrial Revolution themselves because of uh, very bad trade agreements that were forced upon them, things called capitulations, which they had to lower their tariffs or remove their tariffs to European, certain European countries uh, and not be able to protect their fledgling industries themselves. They also had lost territories, very important provinces, the most important provinces uh, in, to the Ottomans that, had, that they had held for hundreds of years, Egypt for one, and most of the Balkan territories, uh, to independence movements, European predation, and uh, particularly to British imperialism in Egypt. So they, they entered the war thinking, we want to reverse these f effects. The second they entered the war, they canceled all the capitulations, all these nice, uh, all these uh, favorable trade agreements. Um, and they also kicked out supervisors from the British and French and Russians that were trying to control their finances or, or other things. And they nationalized a lot of, th a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of uh, companies and organizations and other things that were uh, under European control within their own country. So they also did this to gain time and resources to comprehensively transform themselves. Uh, they, Germany was the greatest industrial power in the world at that point in time. They, had the, they were the largest military on continental Europe at that time, incredibly powerful and very wealthy. And the Germans were very eager to have the Ottomans on their side to help them out. And it was very beneficial for the Ottomans to make this alliance because they got enormous infusions of cash and help to, and to buy themselves some time to try to reform their military and also reform, uh, industrialize their own country much more and, and, and reform their bureaucracies. They also had a lot of internal conflicts to deal with, separatist, national separatist movements, um, opposition parties within, within their own government that they were, that the Committee of Union and Progress, or the Young Turks as they're known as, popularly, 
we're trying to deal with and minimize um, also to stave off. And so this was trying to buy them some time. They were trying to lick their wounds from the Balkan Wars because they lost the rest of their European territories, almost all of them. And they're trying to deal with an enormous refugee problem of 750,000 Muslim refugees from the Balkans who were ethnically cleansed as a result of the Balkan Wars. What do we, how do we deal with these individuals? Where do we settle them? What's going on? This is something you don't usually hear about when we're talking about World War I or the Ottoman Empire, but over the course of the 19th century, it's estimated you have roughly two to two and a half million Muslim refugees who are ethnically cleansed from areas in the Caucasus, in Russia, uh, the, and the Ukraine, and around the Crimea, and in the Balkans, and, and driven from their homes as these new Christian states took over and, um, and ethnically cleansed the, the, the Muslim populations that had lived there for, for centuries. And so the Ottomans had to deal with this as well during this time period. And you know, obviously in the end, they're trying to survive. You know? So I don't want to make it out of desperation. The Ottomans, and the Ottomans courted different Entente powers. They talked to the Russians. They talked to the British and the French. The British and French and Russians talked to them. Uh, about joining alliances. In the end, they got snubbed by the Entente powers. And in the end, it, the circumstances happened that the, the central powers were, were their best bet. It was a conscious decision that they made, one out of practicality and geopolitical considerations that they made with it. So, uh, you know, I don't, I can go on and on, and I don't <laughs> want to get to some of these other things that are, that are, that are going on. Um, this is the decline, they say, of the Ottoman Empire, basically. From, from its territorial height, all of these areas, to in 1914, this is what it looked like, okay? Um, it was characterized by the Russians as the sick man of Europe, but the Ottomans were still powerful enough to, to engage and become, be part of the concert of Europe, to be part of negotiations. They transformed their military well enough to be able to fight very effectively in the war. They defeated the British at the Battle of Gallipoli here. Uh, they defeated the British down in Baghdad in early 1915 and 16. Um, eventually they, they, suffered, they suffered huge defeats though on the, in the eastern Anatolian and Caucasus region against the, the Russians. But they survived in the war until 1918, all, longer than the Russians survived. You know, they, 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 they held their own and it's important to recognize that, that this wasn't just some, uh, this, this wasn't some predetermined fate that was going to happen to the Ottomans. This is something that happens out of historical conjunction and with unique circumstances that have to be taken into account. It wasn't a predetermined uh, fait accompli, so to speak. So uh, this is uh, British and Russian, uh, Russian uh, imperialism in, in Iran. I don't have a lot of time to go into that. Major, major battlefronts in the Ottoman Empire and in the Middle East during the war. Obviously, I already talked about Gallipoli, major one. You had uh, battles uh, in eastern Anatolia, uh, Suez Canal campaign. You had uh, the Mesopotamia campaign by the British coming in. And then you had the British eventually taking Damascus and, and uh, Jerusalem in 1917. And then the armistice ended uh, in 1918 when the Ottomans capitulated to the uh, and, and um, signed the armistice and declared the end of the war, uh, with withdrawal from the war that way. The major fronts. Now, why the middle, why this is so important, um, I want to get through some of these. Uh, the famous landings of Gallipoli, uh, it's very, I, I just don't have time to go into the battle, battle fronts so much. Um, there we go. So there are four main effects of World War I on the Middle East that's important to realize. The first one is obviously the Ottoman Empire, which had been around for almost 600 years, was gone as a result of, of World War I. The Qajar Empire as a result of World War I was gone. Uh, but in 1925, they had a coup d'etat. The Shah of Iran, he, the, the Reza, Reza Shah, was supported by the British to come in and do a coup d'etat and throw out the Qajar dynasty. The Qajars had been around since the late, 19, late 18th century as an empire. Uh, 
you have the makings of modern Iran coming directly out of World War I. You have the Ottoman Empire is completely gone. And its identity and its populations, its stamp on the Middle East, we still feel its residual effects till this day. But it's important to realize that this created an enormous power vacuum, enormous identity vacuum in the Middle East. Because there was such a thing as Ottoman nationalism over the course of the 19th century that they had developed. There were many of its populations that identified themselves as loyal to the Ottoman state, be they Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. There, uh, and when the empire is gone, what is the political framework now? That is very important. And this is what, this is what we see going on and being negotiated to this very day. The idea of Iraq splitting back up, split, being split up into three different independent countries, well, they were three provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And they were squished together by the British after the war and created something, Iraq, that hadn't existed before in the modern era this way. I'm getting ahead of myself. But just to get you to, to see, there's an enormous power vacuum that happens within the Middle East with the result of the Ottoman Empire being gone. You have a complete transformation of the region's demographics. And we'll get into that in a lot more detail in just a second. And it creates the contemporary Middle East state system as we know it, pr pr pretty much. You know, you have modern Iran, its borders coming out of this. You have the Republic of Turkey. You have Jordan being created as a result. Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and eventually Israel being created out of this. Saudi Arabia emerges out of this. An independent Egypt eventually emerges out of this. All linked to World War I and its aftermath. It's a who's who of the Middle East sta nation states, basically. Kuwait, 1924, gets its, you know, it's created. Uh, it just, just enormous amounts of uh, huge influence there. And then the origins or the creation of the Arab-Israeli conflict comes directly out of World War I. This isn't something that goes back to Isaac and Ishmael. I'm sorry. This is something that's very contemporary. And it's the, the origins of it, it it's created distinctly as a result of World War I and the creation of the mandate system and the new borders coming out of the Ottoman Empire that, that, the, that the European powers uh, enact, okay? So let's, I wanna get into the complete demographic transformation of the region. This is really, really very important. There we go. There is an unprecedented death and destruction in the Middle East. Uh, estimates as high as 25% of the Middle East population died as a result of the war. That is a percentage higher, three, almost three times higher than any other country involved in the war. How this doesn't get sp spoken about in, in uh, most of the textbooks or most of the, the surveys of, uh, on, the middle, uh, on World War I, I don't understand. But they die as a result of disease, famine, wartime, you know, combat but also massacres, ethnic cleansings, and genocides. And then you also have population exchanges that in the end result in roughly estimates at five million people in the Middle East. And the Ottoman Empire's population was only 21 to 24 million at the time when the war started. So you look around this room, you think one in four or one in five of the people right here would be gone. Think about the enormous impact that that would have in terms of knowledge, skills, ability to uh, organize government, ability to, for economic prosperity, other things, just to, just to farm the land, to live. You have an enormous loss of life, percentage-wise, as a result of the war in the Middle East. And I can't stress it enough, that has residual effects on every level of Middle Eastern society. And these famines, these massacres, the ethnic cleansings, they reach around the entire empire. And it's important to understand that. Okay. What you get is Anatolia, or what is modern day Turkey, becomes religiously homogenized as a result. You had huge uh, Christian populations in, in what is now today Turkey. Turkey is now, it's estimated 98% Muslim. Whereas prior to the war, it was probably 60-40, 60% Muslim, 40% Christian throughout, okay? It's an enormous transformation in terms of the demographic and who lives there and the long-lived societies that were there are gone as a result of the war. So can't stress this enough. 
the military loss of life, as we talked, Ottoman soldiers who were, who were Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. You had uh, the Ottoman army was a diverse army, particularly in the beginning. And then as the war went on, you had increased uh, paranoia and increased uh, feelings of th threat from, uh, from the Committee of Union Progress, the Young Turks, against the Christian populations in particular. And so they removed Christian soldiers as the war went on. Uh, but you have, a, it's estimated, about 770,000 deaths that are war-related, that are combat-related. You have Armenian Christians between 800,000 and 1 million. Look, the, the, um, they're Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic. The Armenian populations have a, quite a, their own religious diversity within them. Uh, and the estimates have actually been as low as 200,000 to as many as 2 million. This is, uh, but mostly it's, uh, those, those highs and lows are for propaganda purposes. The most, the, this is probably the, the most real, the most accurate, accurate numbers. Greek Orthodox Christians between 750 and 900,000. That die as a result of the war. Um, but that's all going on into the, uh, the Turkish War of Independence and the population exchanges as well. It's not directly related to 1914 to 1918. Assyrians, Chaldeans, or Assyriac, there are different groups that have lumped in usually together under the title of Assyrian. They're a Christian, a long-lived Christian community. We don't know exactly how many, but it's estimated around 250,000. They experience um, a mass, uh, experience mass murder and, and genocide along with the Armenians. And then there's about roughly about 2 million Muslims of uh, Arab, Kurd, Turk, Circassian, Laz, Balkan, and Caucasus refugees, et cetera, that die as a result. Of this, of this time period, with uh, one, 1. 1.2 million dying in Eastern Anatolia as a result of the war and as a result of reprisals back and forth, ethnic cleansings from Russians and Armenians, and then also the, the wars itself. It's, it's a bloodbath. It is a horrific time period to be in the Middle East. And you see a lot of the tensions and a lot of the nationalist problems and, and that continue between various countries in the Middle East to this day as a result of this. So the total deaths are about 5 million. The Ottoman population, as I said in 1914, was between 21 and 24 million. This doesn't count the numbers in, in Iran. It's a little harder to, to, to pin down exactly the numbers there, but it's estimated that they lost a similar percentage of their population as well, mainly due to famine and starvation and disease that spread through their, their country. Uh, I wish I had time to go through the evolution of uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide in the Ottoman Empire and into world, in, into world War I itself. But understand that you have, there are enormous amounts of contingency going on here. You have, it's called, a, oftentimes social scientists use the terminology called security dilemma. Many, any of you are familiar with this to describe what's going on. The Ottomans have been subject to predations, territorial and population wise for a century by European powers. They have, they've suppressed, brutally suppressed nationalist movements within their, within their territories to try to maintain their, inter their territorial sovereignty and integrity. Uh, populations themselves who ha aspire for independence, who are trying to carve out spaces of autonomy or trying to maintain their rights within the Ottoman system um, as it's transforming over the 19th century. In the security dilemma, they, uh, they try to protect themselves. And so they smuggle in arms or they make deals with, great pow with some of the other European powers to try and protect them. This exacerbates the Ottomans, Ottoman paranoia and feeling of threat already. So they step up and they ratchet up their oppression. This ratchets up the other side's fear. And this is this cyclical pattern of the security dilemma. And that's a pretty good way to, of making sense of what goes on in the Middle East. And how do you get to the point where uh, long-lived communities, people who've been living side by side for centuries and ethnic diversities in terms of ethnicity and, and religion and, what, and language, how do they get to the point where they commit mass murder of each other? How do you get to the point where they engage this, engage in these types of activities? I don't have a good reason or rationale, and I'm not trying to excuse anybody for what they've done. It's horrific. But how do we understand what's happening, okay? Because of these atrocities, because of these brutal deaths that occurred on all sides in the war, you have enormous propaganda that's produced by the nation states, that, uh, uh, the successors of the Ottoman Empire, 
the Turkish Republic and the Republic of Armenia eventually. They have bitter wars, of propaganda wars against each other and engage in horrific activities against each other in terms of assassination attempts and, and successes in terms of assassination of each other, of wars, battles of, of demonizing uh, Muslim populations and ethnic cleansing Muslim, Muslim populations within their own territories, these types of things. How do we get to the, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to excuse anybody or let anybody off the hook, but, but we need to understand what actually happened and cut through the propaganda from both sides as they use it and abuse it for their own particular purposes and realize that these are human beings that are caught in the middle. These are human beings that, are, that their lives are destroyed regardless of who they look, what they look like, what religion they have or language or their socioeconomic background or whatever. So these types of things, you have enormous amounts of, uh, of death and killing among Muslim refugees, Muslims who are living in the, the, uh, the Russian Empire as they expand and, and take over ter Ottoman territories in the Balkans, and they're being settled in the most critical zones in the empire, where the bulk of Armenians and other Greek Christian populations live. This isn't something that, oh, you know, generations ago it had happened. This is something that maybe happened just six weeks or a few months before they being ethnically cleansed because of their religion, killed, raped, kicked out. And they're being resettled in areas where they are now part of the war zone when the Russians are coming in or the British are invading or others. And you have them then turning around and perpetrating horrific acts of violence against communities and groups that they see now as a threat of possibly being a fifth column for the Russians as they invade Eastern Anatolia, the Armenian populations particularly. This does not, I'm not using this to excuse the acts, but to focus in on the human suffering that happened and what's going on. Oh, don't have time to go through some of these, these pictures. But just, just so you get a sense that you understand that the, you, there's almost the complete homogenization in terms of religion, religious identity in Anatolia as a result of World War I. This is going to change at some point. That, too much. Well, we'll keep going. Um, basically, what started out as deportation orders by the Committee of Union and Progress, the Young Turks of the Armenians in Eastern Anatolia, turned into mass killings and genocide uh, of hundreds of thousands. The Armenians <laughs> bore the greatest brunt of the atrocities as any one population. More Muslims died, but as a, as a percentage of the population, as a target, they suffered the most. The Greek communities, the Greek Orthodox communities, they suffered enormously, but they weren't subject to the massacres in the same way that the Armenians were, even though they were being deported from sensitive areas as well. Uh, the Armenians bore the brunt of it. These are some of the population, the deportation columns in eastern Anatolia in 1915. Uh, the roadside massacres. I don't show these to make light of any of this, okay? This is, I, I this is just, this is the, this represents the brutality of innocent human beings who are caught up in the security dilemma, the nice euphemistic term that I was using to describe what was going on. Uh, major pockets and areas of Armenians that were rounded up and deported down to northern Syria. Uh, roughly almost a million were deported uh, according to the Ottoman Empire records, uh, internal records. And about 500,000 survived the deportation to come down here and have several hundred thousand more murdered when they arrived. So you have the complete dem demographic transformation. That's, uh, during the Turkish War of Independence from 1919 to 23, you had the Greeks the Greek nation state come in and invade, being allowed to invade into Anatolia, even though it was not supposed to have happened according to the armistice agreement of Mudros that was signed by the Ottomans, by the Entente powers, by the British, the French. Um, 
and others, and they invaded, and then that sparked the Turkish War of Independence, where Mustafa Kemal out of Turk and these other individuals came out of to push them back. There is enormous amounts of massacres and deaths by Greek forces against Muslim populations, and then again by the Muslim populations as they're kicking out the Greek forces, taking it out on the local Christian populations in those areas. Um, it's, it's horrific. So the, basically, as we talked about, I, I don't need to reiterate it more, I don't think, regarding the huge numbers as a result of the um, huge numbers of deaths. As a result of the Turkish War of Independence and the Treaty of Lausanne, uh, the Greek nation state, Greece, and the new, newly formed Republic of Turkey, they agreed to a population exchange. Basically, Greek Orthodox, Turkish speaking populations in Anatolia, what is Republic of Turkey, were exchanged with Greek speaking Muslim populations in Greece. And they swapped those populations. Um, and there was enormous suffering as a result of that. But it was state agreed upon and planned and they were supposed to take each other's places and settle in the areas that they vacated respectively. So that's how you get this incredible uh, homogenization of the, of the demographics within the Balkans, Greece, and, and Turkey as a result of World War I. What you have then now with the creation of the contemporary Middle East state, because we had talked about the, this is the other, one of the other great effects of the war, you have two types of state building that go on uh, as a result. One where countries themselves are creating their own borders and creating themselves, such as the Republic of Turkey with its war of independence, such as Saudi Arabia uh, with its conquest of the Hussein family and conquest of the Arabian Peninsula. And, and you have Egypt who is creating itself in terms of revolution against the British in 1918. They get provisional independence as a result of this. Uh, they don't get their full independence until in, into, 19, into the 1950s. Um, but, and then coup d'etat as in Iran overthrowing the Qajar dynasty, uh, the Shah there, and creating the modern, the modern state of Iran. Uh, you have, then the other side is you have state building by decree. This is by European imperialism that comes in and forces new territories, creates new states that hadn't existed there before, uh, and makes them, turns them into imperial possessions for the Entente powers. And this is how you get the contemporary Middle East state system today. Um, I'll zip through this a little bit. Um, just don't have a lot. Basically, you saw the map of the Ottoman Empire pre-war. After the war, here you have Turkey, you have the creation. I didn't do that. <laughs> you have the creation of Turkey, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria. Eventually, Lebanon is created as an independent state. You have the Palestine mandate that is then split into Palestine and Transjordan. That becomes the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan of today. Obviously, Palestine becomes Israel-Palestine of today. You have Egypt that is not a mandate, but fights for its independence through a revolution and tries to stave off European encroachment, uh, British encroachment. And you have a creation of e several new states in Eastern Europe as well as a result of the war. Uh, but obviously, my focus here is in the Middle East. So this is these states, all of these states right here, are all created artificially, okay? They don't go through their own wars of independence. They don't have their national heroes. They don't, they don't have, uh, th they are subject to European predations in terms of imperialism. They're subject to um, the whims in many ways of the, of the British and the French. These mandates weren't supposed to be able to be divided up or changed but Syria was carved into Lebanon and Syria by the French. That's against the League of Nations charter that, that established the mandate system. There wasn't supposed to be a Jordan created out of the Palestine mandate. That was supposed to all be Palestine. But the British and the French with, with, did, it, did it anyways. And these, these, uh, these states don't have the same cohesion among their populations. They weren't, they, for instance, Iraq, as I said earlier, um, stuffed together three very different 
provinces of the Ottoman Empire, different socioeconomic, linguistic, ethnic provinces of the Ottoman Empire into one, one state. A political nightmare, but an economic powerhouse. When you give the Gulf outlet here, the oil fields in the south that had been, that had been uh, in, in the Basra area that had been uh, discovered and in the north with a fertile breadbasket in the middle. But this was primarily Sunni, Shiite, and Kurd. And now you stuff them all together artificially, the British did. We have troubles with cohesion in that state till this day. They had to artificially create some type of a nationalist identity for themselves. Um, in some places, particularly in the Palestine Mandate, where you had European, the settlement of Europeans, European Jews coming in and settling in that territory at the disadvantage of the indigenous populations there, uh, supported by the British Mandate, that created an entirely different dynamic. And all of these things are stemming, all these promises made to different groups that they'd have their independence were all, all stemming out of, out of World War I and secret agreements and, other, and pledges. For instance, Palestine was pledged by the British to upwards of six different entities to try and shore up their own, their, their, their own uh, alliances. They, Jerusalem was supposed to be an international zone where the Soviet Union, where, where, not Soviet Union, where, where Russia, Tsarist Russia and France and, and Britain would have access to. Um, so it was promised to those three in that way. The French had aspirations because they had Syria and thought they would get part of Palestine as well. Uh, Palestine was promised to, to, the, uh, to the Arabs, an Arab king could be part of an Arab kingdom. That's where T.E. Lawrence and them come in. And then it was also promised to be a homeland to the Jews through the Balfour Declaration in 1917. And then the British had aspirations on it for themselves. And so these types of, of back, backroom dealings all had to be renegotiated after the war. And uh, it was Winston Churchill who was responsible for a lot of the borders, at least in the, in the British Middle East that they controlled in 1921. So you have you have an enormous impact in terms of the populations, in terms of the, the creation of the new nation states, in terms of the weakness of these new, new states that were created on the ground in terms of identity, cohesion, uh, in terms of ethnicity and others, that we see the residual effects to this day. That's why I claim that World War I is the most important single event in the creation of the modern Middle East today. Thanks very much. Do I stand up here for questions? You can or? stay there. So okay. what we'll do is we'll invite you to make your way up to the microphone here. Tell us your name and what you're studying. And we've got uh, just a few minutes remaining for questions. So please. Hi, Joseph Heath, European Studies. Um, so concerning the Armenian relocation, am I to understand that there was a much larger pale of settlement and they were all either, um, like we said, killed or relocated to the tiny country that is Armenia nowadays? Uh, no, there's, there, let me, I'll, there's a good map here. Armenia eventually becomes, comes up into here. Yeah. Uh, they weren't all relocated there. There was a large Armenian population on both sides of the border where the Russians had come down and taken this territory uh, over the course of the 19th century. And then you had a large Armenian population that was in Eastern, uh, Eastern Ottoman Empire. They made up about 40% of the population there in the, in, the, in the Eastern part. It was these, the Armenians living in the Eastern portions of the Ottoman Empire primarily that were subject to the deportation. And they were subject to deportation down here okay. in what is Northern Syria and in Mosul. Uh, to that, those areas. So those that survived the war and these deportations and the massacres and the atrocities, many of them made their way down to Lebanon. Others made their way back over to Armenia. You did have about 250,000 Armenians from this region that fled the deportations into Russian-held territory as well. So it's, you can't call it a pale of settlement because that's a specific term looking at the, how the Russians treated the Jews in okay. Eastern Europe. Um, the Armenians weren't confined to those areas. The largest the largest population of Armenians in any city in the Ottoman Empire and in the world was Istanbul. Though they were not, with the exception of a couple hundred, they were not subject to the deportations. The Armenians living in Izmir and in um, Izmir uh, in the eastern and uh, the western 
Ottoman Empire weren't necessarily subject to the deportations. It was primarily those in this region that okay. were. Does that help? Yes, thank okay. you. you I'm John Collier. I'm in European Studies. Um, I'm just interested in your claim that the um, aftermath of World War I started the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I've mm -hmm. heard, of course, the Ishmael uh, yeah. hypothesis, and I've also heard that it started after World War II um, with the creation of the Israeli state. But what's your take on that, and how, how would you explain that World War I actually created that conflict? Okay, um, primarily because in World War I, you are, dating back to the late 19th century, you had Zionist, uh, Jewish nationalists from Eastern Europe particularly, who were settling in the Ottoman territory of what we call Palestine. It, there was no Ottoman territory called Palestine, but in that region, and what they saw as historic Israel in their mind. Um, but there was already a long-lived Jewish population that was there. That created some tensions between the local indigenous populations, but there was no outright warfare or, or serious tensions. It really ratcheted it up post-1917 and post-World War I when the British mandate of Palestine was awarded to the British. And the British allowed wholesale immigration of European Jews to come and colonize and settle in Palestine. This caused a lot of tensions. This ratcheted up in tremendous tensions between the local populations, Arab populations primarily, Christian and Muslim, and the, and the Jewish populations, the European Jewish populations that were coming in. This created a lot of tensions there, and it resulted in large revolts. The 36 to 39 uh, was called Arab Great Revolt within the Palestine Mandate. This sowed the seeds of tensions. This gave the, the Zionists room to work to create, to create the foundations of the State of Israel, which transitioned into 1948 and the, in, and the independence, the Declaration of Independence by, and the 1948 war. But you also have, that's also when the British renounced the mandate and moved out. But the conflict really gets it starting with this Balfour, with, with the post-World War I period and the, the, the awarding of the mandate to the British. Thank you. Okay, you bet. Dr. Kent. All right. um, so I had a question about um, to what degree does that Ottoman influence that they had, is it reflected today in their interest, Turkey's interest going abroad? And I know like, for instance, I'm interested to what degree these things are connected. Like there's a pan-Turkic movement coming out of Kazakhstan where they're trying to unite all the scripts so they look alike, you know? And so to what degree is Turkey interested in that type of stuff? Uh, well, this idea of pan-Turkism uh, goes back to the 19th century. Um, but it's much more of kind of a geopolitical, let's band together and preser preserve ourselves in the face of European imperialism uh, than it is actually a nationalist, a cohesive nationalist movement. Uh, it's, there's this tur a, a Turkist or Turkism movement, this idea of literary heritage, pride in one's culture, language, created identity, you know, a created identity that way. And so you do have, you know, just like there's an Anglo Anglophone world where we might in the United States feel a little more uh, close to the Britons, the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, the South Africans, uh, than maybe other countries uh, like France or something like that. You know, let's not get too uh, polarized there. <laughs> but um, uh, you have that similar among other uh, similar speaking, or the Arab world, as we call it, the Turkic speaking world, I think. I, I hope that answers your question to some extent there. Yeah, it does. Okay. All right, well, please join me in thanking Professor Scholl.